Welcome to episode 171 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer, director Ed Gass Donnelly. Ed recently wrote and directed a feature film called Lavender. We dig into this film and we also talk a bit about how he broke into the business as well. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they are very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I'll also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 171. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Ed Gass Donnelly. Here is the interview. Welcome, Ed, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Um, I'm from, uh, from Toronto, from Canada, and um, I actually grew up in uh, mostly doing food. Dad was a prominent theater director back in the 70s, grew up to both still in the present day. And so I originally started, were, you know, uh, I had aspirations to, to direct in theater, and I did that for a little while, and then... And I guess it was, you know, that was it. Gosh, I mean, like around when I first started making, like even my first short film, maybe like 16 years ago now. And it was, I think, it was, I just remember it was right around like the advent of like the Canon XL1 where, you know, it was that first sort of mini DV camera that actually looked decent. And mm -hmm. suddenly it, it was like right around the sort of, you know, what I was calling the democratization of like filmmaking where suddenly it wasn't, you didn't need as much stuff or you didn't need as much money in order to, to pull it off. And, so I was always intrigued by the idea of, of, of movies, but they just seemed so much more technical, whereas, you know, doing theater, I mean, you could, you could literally have an, just an empty room and actors, and you can make brilliant theater, but you need a bit more than that to make a movie. So I guess I was always daunted by that. And then, yeah, around that time, I sort of got to, to, um, to explore it and sort of, you know, I worked as a director's assistant on, a, on, a, on an MOW just to sort of get a, a feel for it. And then... Uh, you know, shortly thereafter, I started adapting, you know, some, some writer's work into short films and writing my own, and it just kind of, from into music videos and eventually, and eventually features, but that's kind of the, okay. that's kind of the arc. Yeah, and let's talk about those shorts, um, short films, just for a, a quick second. I'm a big proponent of, of writers, you know, writing and then producing their own shorts. Maybe you can just talk about, um, you know, how did you fund these, and ultimately, how did you promote them um, to help you get to the point where you went from shorts to features? Well, I mean, it, it, it's funny. I can be a bit of a, a double-edged sword in some ways. I feel like in terms of like career movement, like the, the the crappiest feature might do more for you than the best short in some ways, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because at least because there's because I, I guess it's so like now you can do it, make it a, a movie on an iPhone that like uh, to at least somehow be able to like complete the trial by fire of finishing a feature somehow feels more impressive, even if it's mediocre. Yeah. Um, then um, at least I guess the perception of you in, in, in an industry and people taking you seriously. And I guess that it's one thing for people to actually see your short and maybe get loud by it, but it's like, oh, you made a short film. It's like, you know, join the club of millions. But at least I think we've made a, a feature. And, and so it's weird. Not that I would encourage to go and make a, 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 a bad feature, but there is, I think you can spend, I think you can end up spending too much time making shorts, I guess is what, really what I'm saying. But, um, you know, when I first started doing them, I mean, my first, couple were shot on film and it was just you know back in the day I mean, too, it was a, a camera assistant who had a bunch of short ends I was suddenly giving them you know the chance to, to shoot their first one of their first projects so they you know so we shot everything for the whole movie we made for like, just like a six minute film and we shot on 35 and made it for like two thousand dollars Canadian which is like American dollars mm -hmm. um, 
But, uh, um, and I, I can't remember how I got, raised the money. I think we just did like a fund. I mean, I, I was always pretty good at like doing fundraising events, like going to like local restaurants and I was like, you know, and stuff like getting into like donate stuff and then doing like a charity, like a, you know, it wasn't charity per se, but you know, like a, Hey, help us make a our movie kind of event. And, uh, um, yeah. and that's how we kind of, I mean, also in Canada, there is, um, we do like, we have like, uh, grant money that we can get for, I mean, my, my first two I made without grant money, but then I got, you know, grants for subsequent ones. Okay. And what was your first feature film? Was it This Beautiful City? That was my first feature, yeah. Okay, so how did you make the leap from short films to um, feature films? Was it just a function of, of doing these same things you've been doing with the shorts, going, getting grant money, going, and, you know, talking to people to, to donate some money to it, just doing it on a bigger scale? Um, no, I mean, that point, I mean, Beautiful City was actually, was based on a play of mine that I had done, and, you know, we, we'd sort of, in the process, of sort of had thought, like, hey, this would actually make a good, um, a good movie, and this was still at the time when I was, even, even then when I did it as a play, I hadn't done a play in a few years, but, uh, so, after having just, you know, it was like, I don't know, like a, a one-hour minute play, I can't remember now, but, you know, I was like, okay, like, I think this could be actually really cool. And so, you know, we tried several different avenues. There was, you know, um, in Canada, there's a couple of places that will fund, like the Canadian Film Center. You can make like a couple of movies a year to fund. And we tried that and we got, but ultimately didn't succeed, which ultimately really actually was a, a blessing in disguise. Because, you know, the script, if, I, if we'd gotten then, like, the script was definitely not ready to shoot at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think we didn't realize that until, like, you know, we then ended up, you know, I think that we were sad in June and then we ended up basically waiting another year and so in that in the process of that time really realizing like okay like the idea of this is cool but to actually make a, a movie you know it, it just needed a lot more time especially because it was my first you know it was my first feature screenplay like it really needed that extra time so you know, when it came to actually making it we tried to get uh, like the traditional not, I mean, at, at that level you know we made that for about a quarter million dollars and that's not even like we don't there's not grants so much it's a weird there is more now you can get grants for like investments and a quarter million level, but it's a bit of a weird kind of in between. Like it's not a full on movie, but it's also not change either. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we we actually got we, the, the only way that we managed to pull that off was we convinced a distributor. And this was like unheard of at the time. We were, we were also cocky, but it's not unheard of. And really, like we convinced a distributor that's like a seventy five thousand dollar MG against it, just off the script and having me ever. It only made. But that was enough to again trigger um, Canadian tax credits. So, and then you know, my, my we were hoping for a, you know some grant money that just didn't arrive. And I was like, well, we could either make this movie for like 150 thousand. We're gonna have to shoot it on on on, on digital, or if we, if we needed 100 more, you know, my uh, my partner and I, like Leon, my producing partner on that, he uh, he and I basically, you know, I basically borrowed. 50 grand, and he put in 50 grand, and we did it with, 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 partly with our own money, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, which, you know, of course, you never really supposed to do, but and we, you know, we didn't make it back per se, but the thing was, by having done that, and now we're officially making this sort of feature series, at least from a funding level, like, we were able to suddenly access a lot of funding that we wouldn't have been able to before, so even though, in some ways, it's like, some of your first movie is like a loss leader to the rest of your career, mm -hmm. um, and it should be a passion project, but I mean, if you can obviously make it using your own money, I highly recommend it. But yeah. uh, but we did end up, you know, um, getting a, a substantial amount of it through tax credits and, and a distributor. But which really was the if we didn't have that distributor, none of it would have together. But uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's dig into um, Lavender, starring Justin Long, Abby Cornish, and Dermot Mulroney. Um, maybe you can start out by just giving us a quick pitch or logline for that film. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, a psychological thriller about a, a photographer who's obsessed with photographing these old farmhouses and has no real idea why. And then one day, sort of after an accident, she wakes up with missing memory, with, with missing memory, and as she keeps her memory back together, she finds out that she she owns one of these you know uh, houses that she's photographed, and she actually may have been responsible for the death, the death of a family she never, that she never even knew she had that once lived there. And so the whole piece is kind of like a cycle of uh, memory play. With, um, with a bit of a supernatural twist. I see. So, where did this idea come from? Well, this is one of the earlier projects. It's probably the project, the single project that's taken me the longest to read thus far. And um, my friend Colin 
had brought who, who co-wrote the script with me had had written an initial draft of it that I'd been sent like years and years and years ago, and um, and had a really interesting sort of idea, but like you know I wasn't connecting with it. And then years later, you know after that, he brought me like a an updated draft that I was like, oh, I can see the potential of this, and we worked on it together for a while, and then. Ultimately, you know, I sort of came on and wrote it for the next while, and it just it, it was a slow, slow evolution because I guess the challenge for me in any movie that has like these kind of memory stories and what the I think it was like what's the in like she wasn't a photographer before, and especially if you didn't anything with ghosts, it's like the biggest thing is like why now? It's not like I've, I've, you can't just be like oh, 25 years ago to the day, and that's why the movie starts, as opposed to tying it to a stronger sort of emotional. Um, Catalyst, and that was. And once we sort of figured that out, that for me was like, okay, now I can see how I can make this movie and, and justify like this is what I should watch, and it's how. Because the other thing too is that for me, in these kinds of films, if it's just about a happy couple, and then suddenly like, oh, they and their their you know their house is haunted, and then they fix it, that just kind of is people that normally in peril and come back. I actually prefer the idea is like, how can this the story, like what does it ultimately accomplish? And for, from in, in Lavender, it's very much a cathartic arc, cathartic arc where there is a, like a pre-existing condition in this relationship. And so much through the course of resolving everything that happened, really, you sort of feel like the, her and her husband and family can actually become close together as a result. And the, the sort of splinter that was dividing them has, has finally been conquered. So, that it was, it was all those you know elements that really just took it from being, I think you know conventional. It actually has a, has a greater sense of depth and mm -hmm. is you know more is, is actually more worth making and seeing. Yeah. So let's talk about the um, collaboration with Colin on this. It sounds like um, from what you just described, and just kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but you basically took the the draft that he gave you. You went off by yourself and did rewriting, or was there some back and forth where you were getting notes from him and he was writing scenes? Yeah. Was, scenes? I mean, at first. I mean, I had hired him to to do work on it, and then it was just like and we sort of felt like he, you know he 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 was like okay I, I don't really know what where else to go with this. So frankly, we you know we sort of like put it in a drawer for you know six months, and then one day I just sort of had an idea. And I was like you know I'm gonna take a and then we back and forth, and and it just became a collaboration after that. Mm -hmm. And let's talk just a little bit about your own writing process. Um, when you're writing a script, how much time do you spend sort of in the preparation stages versus um, the actual opening up final draft and writing script pages? Um, I mean, I, mean, I would say, like, you know, writing doesn't take very long, but, like, coming up, you know, but solving the problems it does. And so it's like I time sort of just doing things in point form, like in the notebook or just, you know, structuring it and, you know, figuring out either – Especially if it's a rewrite of somebody else's material, um, you know, flagging issues that need to be resolved, or with my own, just kind of plot it out, but in, in short form. And I do that so that I can really sort of fully understand what the movie is. And then the execution, you know, I can often then just turn out a draft in, you know, week, 10 days, and then sort of look at it as a whole. Um, but it, I, I'm only able to write that, you know, quickly if I've actually you know, fully planned out exactly what I'm going to do in advance. And obviously things change, but yeah. so you have to have a strong sort of thesis, at least for me, before I can uh, write. Like, I, I don't really do exploratory writing to figure out, um, to find a movie. I, I tend to just plot it in my head in advance. Yeah. So, and I guess this question could be directed specifically at Lavender, but I'm curious, um, just to kind of get your thoughts, how do you know when a script is ready to start sending out to people? Um, you must have some trusted producing partners or, you know, people in the industry that you just want to get their feedback on. And how do you know when it's that time to start sending it out? Um, I don't know. I think it's a constant <laughs> a constant recurring failure because mm -hmm. <laughs> you always think it's ready and it's like you know there's a person right now that you know we sort of sent out and it was option for a while and uh, um, and you know ultimately just responded but then you know uh, I sort of spent some time on it and now suddenly there's um, you know multiple people wanting it but it was like I didn't know that the first time I couldn't you know, I don't know that I could have made the progress I made without sending it out the first time and sort of like flailing with it a bit. So I, I don't really know. I mean, I did certainly in terms of like, usually as soon as I, you know, type the end, I send it to somebody. Like I send it to a handful of friends mm -hmm. that are like, you know, we'll keep it, you know, we'll not share it. And, you know, I certainly wouldn't send it out for, for, all the, for you know, any serious consideration. But whether it's to like, you know, an agent manager or, you know, my wife or a couple of close friends that, uh, well, like, you know, there's like a couple of my producing partners who are my close friends that, 
I all sort of share. I'll show them my, you know, my dirty laundry and get their sort of initial feedback on it, even if it's super rough. But, I mean, for me, I, I, it, it usually gets to the point when, like, I don't know what else to do with it. Like, if I feel like it's accomplishing what I, or I think it's accomplishing what I, what I wanted to, and mm-hmm. I don't have any further ideas, and then, you know, you kind of at some point, and if, and if you know, my immediate peers feel the same way, you kind of give it a, a trial by fire and, mm-hmm. and see how it's, you know, I definitely, you know, believe in testing the waters before going wide with it, and even if you get like a couple of more friendly producers or a couple of friendly buyers that might read it the second time down the road if you know if you realize it's it's not hitting um, the beats that somebody's looking for, or it's just, you know it's not quite accomplishing what you think it should be accomplishing, but. Um, but yeah, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that okay. question because yeah, it's yeah. one that I can think No, I think, I think you gave yeah. us a good answer. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about the um, taking taking and interpreting those notes. So now you've sent this script out to a few trusted friends you're starting to get feedback on. Maybe you can walk through that process. How do you know when to take someone's feedback? How do you know when to ignore someone's feedback? What's your approach to um, sort of the feedback when you're at the early stages of, of developing a script? Well, I mean, it's, I mean it's funny. I'm also an editor, and I think it, it can be the same, uh, a, a, you know, a thought process, which is, you know, some of the, a lot of people might give you bad, you know, notes, and, or like, you know, the plot for the bad studio note. But I mean, it's especially if there's a rec- either if there's a recurring theme, people might be pointing out, uh, you know, a symptom but not the problem. So they're like, oh, cut this scene, or this, this this character doesn't work. But I mean, it, it, it might be that that character works fine. It's just that there's a, an underlying problem, and they're just sort of seeing the symptom and not the and not the disease. So, you know, I just try and look for, especially if you get feedback from more than one person, it's just patterns. If, if everybody, if just one person, tells you that you know the ending doesn't work, but everybody else responds positively to it, then I, you know, tend to unless unless I've had a deep seated fear that the ending doesn't work, and then one person points it out, I'm like, damn it, you, you know, you, you you're probably right. Mm-hmm. But uh, in general, I look for either if somebody just has a brilliant idea, because I think at the end of the day, it's like you know I don't care who came up with it. It's just, if, if there's a strong idea, go with it. But generally, if, if it's we're looking kind of how to fit, if they're for solving, if there's putting people pointing out problems, I mean, yeah, it's just more from your patterns. If a bunch of people are saying the same thing, then then it behooves you to to listen. Maybe not to their suggestion of how to fix it, but at least if it's not accomplishing mm-hmm. the goal you. Um, you set out to accomplish. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's um, kind of talk about once you're done with the script, what were your first steps? So you now feel like you've got a script that you have polished up, you feel like it's pretty good. What were your first steps to actually get this movie financed? Um, well, I mean, it's funny, it's collaborators, so whether that is producing partners or financiers, I mean, in the case of Lavender, um, you know, it was a you know, very high-profile like, American producer that was attached to it at one point, and, but ultimately he ended up stopped producing and became a studio head. So, um, you know, suddenly the, you know the rights came back to me, and you know we just decided you know like I could finance this movie out of Canada, like it doesn't need to be a you know t- at the time we were looking at it being a larger movie, and now I, at, at a certain point I was like, you know I, I don't feel this has to be like a fifteen or twenty million dollar movie. I think this could easily be like a five million dollar movie. And um, you know, I just ended up partnering with a a friend who uh, Dave Below, the other producer on the movie, that came in myself. But uh, I mean, originally we were going to work on another movie that fell apart, and I think it was just like he really responded to the material. And I'm always trying to find just you know good allies to work with and people that you trust and like, um, because it, you know it can be a it's too long a process to work with assholes. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so, you know, from that point, you know, it was just been, you know, Dave brought straight up with a couple of his financial friends, and um, it just it just suddenly kind of came together fairly quickly at that point, and it really just became then a process of, you know, all of that financing was, of course, conditional on on finding the right actors, so then it was just a process of, um, of actually making offers and, and putting together the, the team. Yeah. So let's back it up just a little bit. Um, and you mentioned like your producing partners on this. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you built those relationships because it seems like that's kind of ultimately the key is having those relationships with people who have access to those financiers. Um, maybe you can just walk us back and talk about specifically these people that you worked with on this project and how you ultimately met them originally. I mean, it's not, it just I guess through the, the nature of the sort of existing, you meet people. And to me, Dave... Um, you know, I had I've been hired to write 
uh, a scripture, another American producer, but it was set in Alaska, and they figured, okay, let's, let's, let's shoot this in, in Canada and take advantage of the tax credits, mm-hmm. and they brought on Dave, as you know, who was ultimately going to be the Canadian producer on the film. So as we worked together on that project, we, you know, we became friends, and that movie ultimately fell apart. So it was just it was just a coincidence ultimately of us having been sort of attached to the same project and having been friendly with each other that you know a couple of years later um, or more like a year later I guess I you know shared this script with him and um, and suddenly uh, you know we were working together so you know I guess the, the moral of the story is you know I guess <laughs> be nice to be blunt mm-hmm. and uh, and and you know maintain contact with your friends but. Uh, I, I, it ultimately just, I think, kind of comes down to that. Like, mm-hmm. there was no way I could have planned to uh, to meet or socialize with him. So he just kind of, we ended up working on something that didn't happen. So, you know, when people say, like, oh, you know, this isn't the right project for you, we're, you know, like, we're passing on this, but maybe we could do it again next time. I think, you know, there is a, you want to, don't just take that as a, as a, as a pat mm-hmm. kind of response, but sometimes it can be. I do think there is some value in you know, maintaining connection with people that you shared, you know, some kind of positive response with. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we can just talk I can talk about the um, cast for a second. I get a lot of screenwriters emailing me, hey, how can I get such and such an actor attached to my project? Maybe you can just talk briefly about how you got these um, these name actors attached to the project. Well, I mean, <clears throat> to get, I mean, to get people attached without having money in place is, is tricky. And it is definitely a chicken in the egg thing. You know, I'm going through it another project now where because to just you know unless you've got you know a, a really high profile producer or, or you know a, a high profile director or some high profile piece of talent attached you know if you suddenly go out to go to uh, an agent and be like hey can you tell your client to read this script we'd love for her to play the lead in, in this movie it's 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 highly unlikely that you know, they might pass it on, but it's just going to be sitting at the bottom of a pile or, or, or it might not be accepted at all. If you make an actual offer, then, I mean, an, an agent is, you know, legally, uh, at least until they're contractually obligated to present the offer to their client and the script. So, I mean, and that became, even if it's not that high an offer. So, you know, Lavender, when we had one, you know, financier come on board, I mean, the sort of the dance you kind of do is like, well, they're not necessarily going to commit the money for the movie unless you have the cash, but if you can at least get them to approve, for example, a okay. Well, if you can get these, you know, one of these twenty actors will make the movie for this price, or if you get these actors, will make it for this other price. So if you have that sort of pre-approved list, then if you can get them to actually back an offer and say, okay, we'll pay so and so hundred thousand dollars, so and so ten million dollars, then because they feel confident that oh, if if that actor says yes, then everything will come together. They don't feel you know they're not putting themselves. Um, at risk by making that offer. I mean, if you just as a as a as a as a, as a you know writer or director just suddenly go up to an actor and say, "Oh, I'll give you a million dollars," I mean, and you, if the movie doesn't happen, I mean, you, you can get sued, and that's where it's, <laughs> you want to be able to be very careful. But if you can have that, is where you know having the partners that believe in the project can can really make it a lot easier to um, to go to talent. Yeah, yeah. So perfect. So um, how can people see Lavender? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like for it? You think, I'm pretty sure it's March 3rd okay. if it comes out um, in theaters and then um, and VOD and I'm actually not sure what uh, uh, I'm not sure what has been announced and what I'm allowed to say. Okay. <laughs> you're, my, you're my first interview about the movie and I haven't actually checked in on a couple of things. Uh-huh. Um, or rather, my first interview for the American release. So, uh, um, I, but it is definitely come out in theaters on March 3rd okay. and, and that's select release and, as well on VOD. Perfect, perfect. Um, so what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, if you're on Twitter, Facebook, a blog, whatever you're comfortable sharing, um, you can just give us that now. I'll round it all up and put it in the show notes, but um, if there's some way that sure. you can... Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm on Twitter. It's real ed GD is my, is my handle, but, um, and I, I, use it, I use it sparingly, but, I'm, I'm, uh, but that is the easiest way to find me. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, Ed, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Um, Excellent interview. I really wish you luck with this film. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye.
A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the one who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on, analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts, and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional valuation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing director Martin Koolhoven, who just did a Western called Brimstone. He's originally from the Netherlands, and he built his reputation as a director locally first in his home country, and has now started to write and direct films for the international market. He started with short films and slowly worked his way up to features, and we dig into his entire career from getting that first break right up to his most recent feature film. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.